Alrighty, welcome back to another episode of the AltMed podcast. We are thrilled today to have another GP come and join us. Um, it's my great pleasure joining Mitch and I today, Dr. Stephen Chalk. Welcome, Steve. Hi, guys. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to coming and speaking to you. Oh, uh, yeah. I, enjoyed, I enjoyed Matthew Moore's uh, recent chat. I was a bit jealous that he got in first. <laughs> <laughs> We are starting to um, lean a little bit heavily on the uh, the WA GP scene, and uh, you know, we, your name obviously popped right up, so yeah. Yeah. we had to get you on. But um, yeah, it's it's you know all the work that, that we keep hearing about um, that you're doing over there. So maybe if we can kick things off, do you just want to tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into the space? Uh, going right back. Yeah, why not? Um, right back. Golf. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I've probably always wanted to be a doctor. I think I wanted to be um, a pilot first and then um, my eyes, you know, deteriorated <laughs> and I ended up looking for the next most sort of sexy job. And um, I was actually one of the first in my family to ever go to uni. Oh, yes. So, um, yeah, so I was quite proud of that. And um, studied in Oxford for three years, preclinical medicine, and then moved to uh, King's College London for my next three years of clinical medicine and then hung around uh, London for a few years after that work, doing my rotations and then working in some emergency departments before uh, like most of us do, you know, getting a bit sick of the uh, working conditions and the weather and the, uh, the depressed mood over there and came over here to lovely Perth for a, a working holiday. Um, along with some of my mates who are already here and they quite quickly sort of packed up and left and went home and um, and I've stayed and it's been nine years almost to the day that I've been here in Perth and working. That is absolutely yeah. right because we yeah we chatted to Maddie. he studied I think somewhere um, pretty neat over in the states but we've got you know some of the smartest doctors in the world and oh, yeah. they come to Australia and they come to a place like Perth and settle down. I don't understand it at all. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> How did Melbourne not get a look in at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. if you've ever been to sort of South London and then kind of um, done this whole like, um, you know, 35 degree swing when you step off the plane in Perth and, you know, the beaches and the atmosphere and it's very, very relaxed and so different and it's very uh, hard to do. Yeah. I think Perth has, uh, has got us covered yeah. in many, many respects. But um, and yeah. then, uh, once you got here, how then, what was the sort of transformation from that to, to getting into medicinal cannabis? Yeah, um, when I first came, I was working in the emergency, one of the busy emergency departments here, which to start with, I was really, you know, really loving. Again, it was very different to the UK. And it was quite supportive and educational and um and quite a sort of an improvement on the UK atmosphere. But uh, after a few years, I think, in hindsight now, I think after a few years there, it kind of wore me down a bit. And I think the level of stress was more than I could take. Mm. And um, I wanted to start a family and have a bit more kind of home time. So I moved into uh, GP training. And I did my GP training down in the south of the state, down in Albany, which was beautiful. Mm. Um, and then moved back up here to work as a GP and after a few years of doing that I kind of found myself being drawn into um, cannabis medicine and uh, the story behind that is is really that uh, my patients kept um, asking me about it and kept nagging me about it and kept insisting that it was legal and that how do we get on this and um, I've heard great stuff about the CBD stuff and to start with, like well, a lot of the other docs, I probably just said, no, no, look, it's, it's not legal. Never heard of it um, until actually Little Green Farmer, the, uh, one of our, our local producers, um, had a rep come around and just do a bit of education at my practice. And then I kind of it twigged with me that, you know, there's all this demand, you know, all of these patients really want this medicine. Mm. You know, it's here. It's locally made. It's available. Um, someone's got to someone's got to look into it. You know, someone's got to look into it in this area. So um, I started kind of trying to get involved in prescribing. Um, initially, it was pretty restricted to CBD because of the um, WA state health regulations, um, needing a specialist, you know, specialist approval to start with. Then I found myself um, working with Emerald Clinic, now called Amira. 
and kind of cut my teeth in cannabis medicine in real kind of detail there. And I've kind of moved, um, kind of moved apart from Emerald due to just wanting to be more independent, really, um, and wanting to kind of have a bit more control over my destiny. So I settled into um, GP life and, pres- you know, can- cannabis medicine from um, purely GP perspective there. And um, yeah, so now I've got quite a lot of uh, patient experience and uh, all sorts of different products and conditions. And, um, and I, I started to realize, you know, there might be even be some, some value to that, this sort of experience. So um, kind of kept my ear to the ground for local, you know, local businesses that are moving into the cannabis space from a sort of a startup phase. And I um, happened across um, Rod and the team at, Canaponics here, and um, we're a sort of early, early, early stage uh, cannabis sort of man, uh, licensed producer now. We've got our licenses through, um, and I'm medical director for Canaponics. So um, my kind of real kind of desire to get into this space is that I feel like with some of the cannabis companies, there's not a lot of um, frontline kind of cold face experience. And I feel like often the decisions are kind of made from a bit from a distance without having a good grasp over um, what do these unfortunate people that are, you know, sat opposite the GP, what do they need and what do they want and what's going to help them the most. So I like to, I like the idea of being in this position where we're about to put, you know, seeds in the ground and I can have some influence over that um, with a view to kind of producing an output at the other end for the patient that I'm going to see, you know, later down the track in the clinic. And hopefully I can feed back the experience between um, what's happening um, with patients and what's going to happen in the grow room. Yeah. Well, you you set up the, um, the GP clinic on site at the farm, or I'm just thinking so that the patients can actually look out over. Yeah. (laughs) That'd be great. Um, well, our site, our grow site is in Collie, okay, which is, uh, you know, a few hours down sort of south, um, south of Perth. And it's a little town that's been, um, I think, been suffering a little bit recently from the closure of the coal powered um, state uh, power stations um, and the coal mine there. So there's a sort of um, industry kind of drifting away from Collie and leaving it, you know, with the risk of being a bit of a ghost town so the opportunity is that you know there's a whole you know to bring a new lease of life and a new industry to a town to you know to a to a struggling town so that's what we're hoping hoping to give back to to collie um and our our efforts have been recognized already by the uh, state government which have um, awarded us a two million dollar grant to support uh, manufacturing in regional wa and, and the regeneration of collie so Amazing. So That's definitely really nice. supporting really local communities and, and, and Australian workers as well in the process. Yeah, and hopefully giving patients, you know, access to cheaper, um, high quality Australian made medication in the long run. Phenomenal. It's great. Yeah. Well, you're definitely one of the doctors when uh, when you kind of uh, speak around the community and you get to know the industry, there's, there's a few doctors that seem to get their names come up more so than others, outspoken kind of cannabis advocates, if you will. Yep. Matty Moore, definitely one who we've had. Um, David yep. Fang that we've also had. There's a couple others that are on the on the horizon for us, but but definitely um, your name's come up so many oh, times along the journey. So um, we're yeah really uh, excited to hear a little bit more from you. Um, in terms of your your experience as a GP, we're also very interested in in kind of um, you know a, lo- a lot of people out there. We're trying to get some more information around the general conditions or indications that that you you know uh, prescribe yeah. for um and and just getting a, a bit of an idea of, of your experience on the on that cold face as you were describing before um yeah yeah i mean i think it's true for all of us that um the main you know the number one indication is chronic pain yeah um and that's probably 70 probably initially 90 percent, and now more like 70 percent of our of our kind of patient load um, okay. in GP cannabis prescribing. So it is moving to it into, um, into other areas too, but pain is the real area of need, right? And um, there's, I say area of need because um, there's not really any good options, you know, kicking around for chronic pain patients. So we know that 
one option, you know, that we've been relying on for a long time is opiates. Mm -hmm. And in uh, um, the, you know, the, um, the pain specialists are um, uh, really advising us to uh, GPs, especially to move away from chronic opioid prescribing. Mm -hmm. And there's a good reason for that, because um, if you take um, an opiate for some time, you develop a tolerance to it. And so you might need 10 milligrams of slow release oxycodone twice a day for some time for your chronic pain, whatever it might be, say osteoarth severe osteoarthritis. There will come a time before long when that stops working. And you inevitably go back to your doctor and ask the doctor for something stronger because you just aren't getting the relief you need. And before long, you know, the dose just continues to creep up to the point where they're on higher and higher doses. We can't even go any higher to, um, you know, we're reaching the maximum doses and we, we can't control the pain at all. So we switch to a different opiate and sometimes you get a bit uh, more relief for a period of time. And then the same thing will happen with that opiate. You move on to the other and circle around all the various opiates before you come back onto the first one again and hope that um, having a bit of a, um, um, uh, th th there's some benefit from changing opiates around basically is what I'm trying to say. But mm. inevitably with all of those, you know, the benefit um, declines with time. So really, um, the pain specialists are trying to advise us against prescribing opiates. And um, the other reason is because of, um, you know, because of the high risk of addiction with opiates. Okay. Yeah. So obviously, we all know about the opi opioid um, epidemic in the States and over here. Um, yeah. The, the, the risk of addiction is super high. People will do anything to, you know, um, maintain that addiction because you know, it's so painful coming off an opiate medication. It's so unpleasant. Um, they try other other opiates or they steal opiates or they inject opiates and then, you know, they can have a very high risk of death. So yep. all of us are trying to avoid opiates. And, um, um, you know, so, so that, that option is kind of slowly being taken away from patients and doctors. It's interesting and, that you say that, that yeah. um, the specialists are coming and saying to move away from opiates. Um, yeah. I, I do know that to be true, but... A, a, the same time we've had recently yeah. a couple, and we spoke about this on, on the Maddie Moore podcast, but a couple of noteworthy individuals in the pain space yeah. saying that cannabis is definitely not the alternative. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. 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 I mean, I'll, I mean, the, 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 we also Matt, Matt Moore's um, podcast, which was awesome. Um, he mentioned, you know, um, Lyrica or pre gabbling being, you know, the other option that's touted. And he mentioned, you know, rightly that there's minimal evidence to show that that, you know, is all that good or works that well. And now we're starting to see that that's abusable and has lots of side effects. Whereas previously it was kind of sold to us that it'd be a, a miracle drug and work for, for all kinds of neuropathic pain. And then if you listen to the news, I think it came out of the UK. There was another recent study saying that um, uh, paracetamol, doesn't do anything for chronic pain. Did you did you hear that in the news recently? I think I, I read it. I missed that one actually. Yeah, I'll, I'll dig it out for you if you like for it as a news story. Yeah. Um, and then if you look at the nice guidelines in the UK recently, also um, there's a lot of talk about um, av avoiding non-steroidal anti-inflammatories at all costs. Also, right. So what you're finding is that for a chronic pain patient, there's just no options. It's getting limiting. Yeah, yeah it's, there's, there's just no options. And I personally, uh, I'm quite compassionate when a pa patient comes to me with these severe pains. I'd, I'd, I'd rather prescribe opiates than leave them in pain. Mm. And maybe I'm part of the problem, but, um, you know, I don't think patients should be in pain, you know. Um, but then, you know, then this, the, uh, the um, it was actually, he was actually the head of the, the pain faculty at the um, Australian uh, New Zealand you know, College of Anesthetists. Um, said that cannabis shouldn't be prescribed either. And I think the, the, the reason why I said this is because there's, not, there's no evidence in his eyes supporting the use of cannabis in chronic pain yet. Okay? Mm. So That's what he said. But that's what yeah. he said. So, I mean, the thing is, you know, in terms of high quality, you know, very rigorous, you know, randomized control trials um, against placebo, you know, they're, they're, there isn't a huge amount. There isn't a huge amount of evidence supporting cannabis use in chronic pain, right? But going back to what I just said, you know, there's there are no other options. Mm. And one one thing that there is good evidence for in cannabis treatment 
is an improvement in you know patients kind of sense of well-being and quality of life yeah so say this anesthetist uh, the name i forget i'm sorry um is I correct his bag isn't it yeah yes that's it that's it. um say he's correct say that there is no actual analgesic action of cannabis but there's no analgesic action for any of our other options anyway right but if we've got evidence saying that this one improves quality of life yeah no I, it may have no or minimal evidence of improving pain levels but it improves quality of life then it should be an option to our patients and correct it's a- and it's also i guess it's not saying that there that it doesn't have an analgesic effect the jury's still out i guess in the randomized controlled trial sense we haven't done those trials to uh, to a certain satisfaction so it's it's not necessarily that it doesn't have that in action it's just that we haven't proven it yet potentially oh absolutely yeah absolutely and anecdotally the evidence is you know overwhelming that there are pain benefits with cannabis treatment yeah. and i don't think any of us have i think all of us have you know spoken to people who've had improvements in their pain with cannabis medicine. and so how does that usually look when you're speaking to patients how will they report because you know sometimes the criticism of pain is is it can be somewhat subjective so yep. in your in your opinion as a as an authority on on that how, how do you see you know how do, how do you judge that how do you measure that in a, in a yep. situation that's a good question actually because um some patients will come and say my pain is better all right some patients will come and say my pain is so much better i've already taken myself off my other medications but a large proportion will come and say, I don't think my pain is all that different. Um, And then either spontaneously or on a bit of pushing, they say, um, but they say my pain may not be all that much different, but I seem to be doing more things. You know, I seem to be needing less of my, as required, you know, my PRN medications, quick release, oxycodone or tramadol, whatever it might be. Um, or I'm, my family is noting, noticing that I'm less frustrated and snappy and you know, um, withdrawn. So often the improvement is quite subtle. Mm. And very often patients will say, okay, there's minimal improvement. Um, okay, yes, some other things are helping, but the pain itself, there's minimal improvement. So it's expensive, doc, so I'm just going to give it up. Yeah, gotcha. And often it's then that they realize how helpful it's been. They take, a, they take a bit of time without it and they realize how hard I know this, this has helped me. Yeah, but It's a much more subtle thing than, an, than, a, than, um, than opiates. And I guess- kind of will blot, blot everything out initially at, the, at a high dose. Yeah, you'll start I doing. guess without that kind of dependency profile, it's definitely yeah. preferable from that angle for a lot of people as well. Yeah, yes. that's the, the, the safety profile was actually the point I was going to ask you about because when you think about um, opioids, do you, as a prescribing doctor, I mean, do you think about the interactions that those medi- medications have on the respiratory system, for example, in people who have high opioid tolerance? I mean, that whole discussion around safety profile yeah. is missing from the criticism that's come from Ansgar. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, um, a, a little anecdote about, about that. I remember, um, I think in my first, would have been in my first year in um, the emergency department, working in the emergency department here, I had a, a lady, middle-aged lady come with severe back pain and, you know, I gave her opiates and um, sent her away. And that's the normal course of things in the emergency department. You know, you settle the pain down you know, off you go, back to your GP. Then um, a few, maybe a year later, I was working in the resus area, of the emergency department, and had someone come in, brought in, you know, middle-aged lady brought in with um, um, obvious signs of opiate um, poisoning. And the ambulance had brought in the evidence, you know, there was an empty box of oxycodone there, which actually brought it in. I looked at the box and it was my name, on the script from one year ago. Oh my God. Thinking, oh, sure, how this really brings it home, you know, how um, how dangerous things can be. You try and help, help someone with acute pain and they have, you know, um, a big upset in their life and there, there it was in the back of the cupboard from last year. And, yeah. and you have to, um, 
and then just the sheer number of coronial mm. reports that, that get published where toxicology um, yep. data collected just uh, shows that opioid abuse and it's unintentional of course these people are just simply trying to you know to manage their pain but um you know i had I remember watching a documentary on the opioid crisis and they described how people basically just fade out at, at certain mm. levels mm. the respiratory system collapses um or depresses and and they just they just go sometimes in the middle of their sleep that's just they're they're done and you don't read yeah. about mm coronial findings into overdoses on medicinal cannabis. Um, yeah. I and- think, I, I, so the, the great thing about cannabis, you know, medicinal cannabis is that there's a huge kind of background of evidence from the recreational and illegal use, mm. you know, demonstrating safety yeah. in terms of overdose, right? And I think it's been calculated something like you need 20,000 joints or something like that to kill yourself with, you know. I'm medicine. sure there's some people that have tested that. Yeah, 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 and I'm sure you know some people um, can get very um, can um, have very serious you know overdose side effects if they've got lots of other comorbidities. Mm. Um, but you're you're right, the, the safety profile is much much better than any other um, analgesic that we've got, including you know Lyrica and um, yeah all the other options we have, including Panadol, including Nurofen. Yeah, funnily enough, my um, my grandfather is a candidate for, or is one yep. person who who actually had an overdose, you know, for back pain. Wow. And it was addicted to tramadol, if you're familiar, mm. obviously, with that one. Um, and I think a, a couple of other ones, we didn't even know what he was on in it by the end of it. But it's just, it's not something you would normally think, you know, when you think about people addicted to drugs. I mean, I mean, when I think about it, maybe it's different as a GP, but when I think about it, I think of, you know, younger people addicted, you know, and not, not 70 plus year olds that just can't get off uh something that, that they've been given quote unquote legally um it's it's just such a different perception in my head when you think of drug addled individuals so to speak um but um yeah i've, I've got first first hand experience i guess with yeah you know, and older people can easily get quite confused you know with any little insult yeah and it's a very easy step to take you know your <clears throat> your afternoon medication you know, immediately after your morning medication because you've forgotten and overdose yourself. But I'll, I'll, steal an, I'll steal an anecdote from my um, previous colleague, uh, Professor Vickery, who had a patient that was um, under his, under him, um, the uh, cannabis clinic. And uh, it wasn't one of the sort of early cannabis patients over here in WA. And uh, this patient was admitted to hospital um, for one reason or another. Um, and the nurse misread the um, dosage on the patient's bottle of cannabis oil. And the patient was given 10 times his normal or 10 times his prescribed dose. So imagine, I mean, it's quite difficult to do because that would mean, you know, you know, um, uh, t- taking sort of five whole meals, that's five whole syringes, you know, it's c- quite, quite hard work taking five syringes of um of that quite pungent oil expensive as well <laughs> expensive yeah yeah that would have cost you know 50 bucks or something but um the the chap allegedly um just went to sleep um and woke up the next day saying that he'd never felt so good so, <laughs> was that was that was that um patient andrew by any chance um <laughs> so um so any other drug you can think of, any other analgesic you can think of, a ten times, you know, ten times overdose is is you know it's unlucky to end that. It's very unlikely to end that well. Yeah, yeah. I, even you know something as innocuous, well, seemingly innocuous as Panadol. Um, if you're yeah. doing you know five grams, ten grams of, yeah. of Panadol, you're in trouble. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's very interesting. I'm I'm curious. Just with the, I feel that every time we're chatting to cannabis doctors. I mean, all GPs and all all people in the in the medical field, their number one focus is is obviously patient health. But we tend to talk in terms of, and certainly the way that the regulations work in Australia currently, they are based around this idea that it's a last line therapy or, or it can't be a first line. And we're really talking about treating people who are already sick. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to, I guess, pick your brain about. What do you think when you see other jurisdictions around the world which allow um, certain cannabis oils as a supplement, you know, like a fish oil or a vitamin, 
as part of just incorporating this kind of medicine into people who aren't necessarily carrying any indication or comorbidity. Um, and they just want to take it. I know we can't do that. I'm not advocating for different um, to, for people to do things contrary to the current regulations, but what do you think uh, about that? Yeah, I guess the TJ the TJ regulations actually say that um, it you know it can't be used as a first line, but that reasonable you know reasonable treatments must have been trialed. Okay, so that you don't have to force everyone to jump through every single hoop for every, of every single pain or otherwise medication. You know, if you've tried one or two of some various some um, families of medication, then I think that makes you um, makes you legally eligible. Yeah. Um, and also patients, you know, you're allowed to have some preference and say, look, I'm not, I'm not going to try benzodiazepines for sleep because, you know, I, I, um, I, I don't like the idea of their side effect profile or their, you know, addiction risk. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, um, we should, um, I mean, when I, when I see patients who have, um, who have severe pain or have severe sleep problems, who have, um, severe anxiety problems who have you know, movement disorders. I, I want to immediately prescribe them cannabis. Yeah. Because there's, and I guess, you know, you, what would you want if you were in that situation? You know, <laughs> I, I mean, there's a lot of medications that we do prescribe and that I do prescribe that I would never really want to try myself. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't really want to end up taking um, tramadol every day or, um, amitriptyline every day mm. not very nice and yeah. doctors are even about antibiotics as well now and that maybe just something i don't recall when i was growing up but ever for the last maybe five or ten years every time i've got a, you know a bit of a bad cold you go to the doctor they say i've had most doctors now saying look i really actually would rather not prescribe you this antibiotic but i think unfortunately you're going to need it at this point in time or you know do you want to maybe reconsider you know, I'm going to write you the, the script, but maybe you just need three or four days of, of toughing it out um, just to avoid exposure to those medications. Yeah, that's a, you could, you, we could talk about that for, for a long time because, um, because there's a lot playing into that. So, you know, we're, we're risk averse species, you know, doctors. So we don't really want to be giving people antibiotics um, and producing antibiotic resistance. But also, we don't want to be the person that turned away, you know, um, that early meningitis, you know, with no treatment. So an early bacteremia or early infection, um, bacterial infection often looks just like a cold, you know. Hmm. So you've got to be very brave to say no um, antibiotics. Yeah. Um, and you've got to be pretty confident in your diagnosis. You've got to be pretty confident that the patient's going to kind of come back to you. Yeah. Um, but that's 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 a that's a that's that's a whole other whole yeah, other. Time. I'm taking you on all sorts of tangents. I'll yeah, let you, I'll, I'll you, let you. Yeah, yeah. You, you were talking. Yeah. About, um, so you were talking about you know over the counter access and so on for people just for wellness. Yeah. Um. Well, I think that um, you know they they they're doing that in the UK, you know, and I think that it's not necessarily the right way to go because the um, there's there's just no quality control. And I think there's been studies, published studies, saying that the over-the-counter CBD products just um, have very unpredictable kind of CBD and even potentially THC content. Right. So it's a bit of a, <clears throat> a bit of a dangerous way to go. But I think that there will be a um, you know over-the-counter CBD medication here within a few years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, to to, to some degree, it, if you could have some more control over that CBD. Uh, those CBD plants being CBD and not too high in THC. Yep. I guess at the end of the day, it is a plant into some description. So if, in the plant form, it's not proving to be too harmful to most people, especially if it's CBD dominant. So mm -hmm. envisioning that over the counter or even non-medical, I think there's, you're right. The quality control is less, uh, I guess there's less obviously than the medical situation, but I think there would be room for a supplement type CBD market, a food supplement, which still is, you know, bound to, to, to food safety regulations and then potentially a medical market that is more targeted at, at indications. Do you have any thoughts on, on that kind of scenario? Yeah. I mean, I don't disagree with you because as I say, CBD is really quite safe, you know, mm. 
unless you've got severe, severe liver impairment. Or maybe one or two medications will have interactions. Um, very, usually quite rare medications, you know. Um, it's, it's very safe and um, safer than a, safer than so many things you can you can access, you know, mm. as soon as you turn eighteen. So um, yeah, I don't THC. Pardon? When you think about THC being recreational in Canada, yeah. for example, what what are your yeah. thoughts? Do you feel like that's the right step, or or not not really? Um. I'm not terribly against, I'm not against recreational legalization, right? Because, um, and that's from, that comes from a sort of harm minimization point of view, really. So what, when a lot of my, and, and from talking to my patients, so when, when, when a lot of, um, you know, 40 year old kind of roofers or plasterers or, um, you know, builders get home, from work, they have a couple of beers and they often have a couple of beers because of stress and because of their back is killing them, right? Mm. And that, that's a slippery slope to go down that every night you're having a couple of beers, you know, because there's obviously, there's obvious liver problems, obvious addiction problems and obvious, um, you know, problems with, it's gonna cause problems with your relationship with your children, your wife and, you know, potentially um, <clears throat> waking up being a bit hungover and less productive the next day. So if those people had another option to regulate their stress and maybe take the edge off those, you know, aches and pains, um, one that was potentially kind of healthier, maybe even probably cheaper, and they had one or two inhalations of, you know, vaporized, you know, THC rich cannabis um, flower, you know, I think that would, I think that would be a less harmful thing for them to have. Mm. And, a, and a, um, I think that would be um, a, a much, much better thing to be available. So I'm really quite, you know, I'd really quite like to see, um, you know, adult use legalized at some point here. Mm, interesting. On one side, on the other side, I would rather patients come to me for cannabis treatment than <clears throat> help themselves over the counter, you know, and kind of dabble and give it a go and, you know, um, listen to their, um, uh, their bud tender, you know, the guy across the counter. I'd rather them come to me and, we kind of manage it together um, than them kind of go off by themselves. And the reason being, I've thought about this, and the reason being is because my, I find my patients do better the more hands-on I am, right? So when I see someone and assess them and say, yes, you're right for cannabis treatment, I always want to see them, you know, no later than two weeks down the track, you know, because they need, um, you need, they need reassurance to make sure they're going down the right track with their treatment program. Um, and they need pushing usually to take more, mm. and increase the dose to actually get to the point where it works and you're not just sort of um, wasting it. Um, and then they need ongoing follow-up, one, as, ever, as often as they need it for, for, for questions, and two, just to make sure that that dose is kind of um, being adjusted to their needs at all times, right? Mm. Um, and to think about all the other options that, you know, okay, you're on this oil, but okay, vaporized flour might work better for your lifestyle, or okay, you've tried this, you know, these symptoms haven't settled down. Let's switch over to something or other. And I think that, you know, I don't want recreational um, legalization to kind of take the medicinal patients away from cannabis doctors because yeah. we can do a much better job than them by themselves or um, their them and their bud tender and what they find, read online. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, you understand the actual pharmacokinetics and dynamics. No, of that. no, because I don't sit there and think, oh, this is um, such and such profile and this is, you know, this has such and such half life and there's this interaction and that enzyme. It's just, it, it, with cannabis medicine, it's just about kind of working out what the pattern is of their response, what the pattern is of their life and how their chronic pain, say, would wax and wane through the day. You know, it takes two hours for the oil to kick in. So you have to get the timing right. You have to take it before the pain is at its worst. Mm. You have certain side effects. You have to kind of aim to um, be sedated enough to sleep through this side effect that might kick in or um, <clears throat> if, if, if you follow me there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I don't, like I don't sit down and think about science when I'm with them. I think about just, you know, how to kind of smooth things out for them and what sort of pattern and what sort of tips and tricks might might work because for every side effect from cannabis there's a there's a trick to kind of overcoming it or getting around it what, what about when you're actually phasing someone onto cannabis medicine and getting them off something that might 
considered a bit more harmful, like a, a benzodiazepine or an opioid or something like that? Yeah, usually when someone comes in, let's talk, talking about chronic pain, usually when someone comes in and they're at the end of the road with chronic pain, and they're desperate, they're on a few, they're on a cocktail of a few things, you know, a slow release opiate, a quick release opiate, Lyrica or Gabapentin, um, an antidepressant like Cymbalta or Deloxetine, um, and then a nighttime medic medication for sleep like Amitriptyline or Endep or um, Valium or Tamazepam. Wow. So that's the, you know, when, you know, these are nearly always together in combo when the patient's at the end of the line and they come to us. Right? How and much, nearly, how, how, just sorry, I'm, I'm just, do you know, even with PBS, um, you know, subsidization, how, how much is someone shelling out for that? I, I actually don't know, right? Um, yeah. But the secret for those patients would be to shop around the pharmacies and make sure that they all price match with each other. Wow. Because often, I shouldn't be saying this because I've got some pharmacist friends, right? But, um, you know, often th there's a markup that's just blindly put on there. Yeah. And if, you are, if you're on all those medications, I think you should be um, standing up for yourself and negotiating. I actually don't know because my pharmacist, if I want any medicines, you know, or if I'm prescribed any medicines, my pharmacist gives me a little discount. So I don't really follow up the chemist warehouse and say, yeah, I'm going to grab um, some Colgate toothpaste, going to grab a few things here. And um, yeah, the guys down the road at Terry White are doing uh, benzos for, you know, can you guys yeah, price match it by 10%? Is that yeah. Yeah, nice? Bit of hustle. No, no price match. Yep. That's, anyway, that's but what, what were we talking about? Sorry. Yeah, uh, so we were saying. Chronic, we were chronic saying, pain. <laughs> how do we wean people on so the reason they're with us okay the reason they're coming to see us is because they're on all those things and it doesn't work all right or it's not perfect if their life was perfect they would stay on all those things um but they still have pain despite being on all those, th on all those things so we add in you know we would add in cannabis medication on top of their other medication right and very slowly just build the dose up until you start to get um a response when you know that you're starting to get a little response, then you know you're on the right track and the patients need to be encouraged to just keep going to get up right up to the dose that actually works. Yeah. And when you know it works, then you know it's okay to start taking things away. Mm. And for me, that would be usually, you know, you know that cannabis is really helpful for sleep. So those nighttime medications, especially something like amitriptyline um, or NDEP, which is a sedating antidepressant that's good for nerve pain, you know, I, that's my, normally my first target because um, it's cannabis is good for nerve pain, cannabis is good for sleep. So we try and get rid of that one first and you know, slowly come off of that one, watch for, the, um, watch for the symptoms and then just creep the cannabis dose up again to take over where that medication left off. And then we may not get it down low enough. Um, you know, we may not be able to get, it, get, get rid of that medication. We may find that you know, we've halved the dose and we put in a bit of cannabis medication on top now the symptoms are controlled. Now we have to say, well, is it worth coming off of it? Because, you know, if you take an extra mil of cannabis a day, you know, that's probably, you know, maybe an extra $4, you know? Mm. Um, is it worth that cost or do we just keep it as it is, you know? And then say we've got rid of that medication and we think of the next easy target, which might be um, often things like melatonin and um, PEA. They're very easy targets. They're very expensive. They're not subsidized and they're very easily replaced. Mm. Um, and then you, uh, then I tend to pick the, the medication that's the most troublesome for that patient, you know, and they might say, okay, well, I really hate these opiates. They're just horrible. And I might say that Lyrica has this side effect. I really want to get rid of it. And then you try that one and mm. you may have to add in cannabis, you know, it's different times during the day, a lunchtime dose as well. Um, CBD in the more extra CBD in the morning, um, to try and remove that one and just take them one by one and take them slow. And remember, you don't have to get rid of everything. If you halve the dose. You've done a, if you reduce the dose at all, you've done a great job. Yeah. So it sounds like you're almost an advocate for start low, go medium pace. Yeah, I'm pretty gung ho <laughs> when it comes to dosing, right? Right. Um, because uh, depending on the patient, so if you've got a confident patient, you know you can be quite gung ho. But if you've got um, a patient who's not confident, who's worried, or who's, who's sort of very old um, and frail, then you go extremely slow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if it's for someone like you. I would just say crank the dose up as quick as you want. <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly, um, and I probably would take your your advice as a. I'm as sure a, you would. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, interestingly, with, with chronic pain, um, do you find that there's different 
types of chronic pain that it works better for, say fibromyalgia or neuropathic pain? Are, are there certain types of pain that you're you're kind of more drawn to? And then are there certain types of pain that you're like, actually, in my experience, it's been less effective for? Yeah, good. Um, good question. I, you know, osteoarthritis is a really common um, cause of pain, right? So mm. we're all we're all running or running around wearing our joints out and we just don't recover. And as we get older, we all just get joint pain, just inevitable. Mm. And some much, much, much worse than others. And you know what? There's there's just very little we can do about it. It just there, nothing seems to work. Mm. And I find you know that's the that's the toughest pain to control with any medication, in, in, especially with cannabis. And I think that's probably because it's just ongoing um, noisesceptive pain, meaning you know ongoing detection of damage by the by the body at that at that <clears throat> at that joint line. Mm. So it's very hard to, to deal with. And I think you know the, those are the ones where you know sur- you, you know surgery and pain specialists work well if they can inject and block nerves and just chop the thing out. Um, yeah. So that, you know <clears throat> not to say that it that it that cannabis doesn't help with those things. So sometimes you know. You find um, some people with just a low medium or medium dose of CBD, just it works and they're just back to normal. And, um, and some people, they need THC and it works. And some people, nothing works. And yeah. uh, OA, osteoarthritis is one of the hardest to, to get on top of. The other types of, the, I mean, I think that ne- neuropathic pain is the, the nicest one in terms of responding to THC. Mm. It just um, So neuropathic pain from peripheral neuropathy or um, <clears throat> trigeminal neuralgia or many many causes um chronic regional pain syndrome <clears throat> those seem to respond the best to thc and they can respond really nicely mm. and um fibromyalgia to be honest i think fibromyalgia we tend to do well with yeah and with people with fibromyalgia <clears throat> they're um they are most gps just living nightmare because um they're so tough to deal with because they have so many symptoms um that all seem unrelated and all seem you know really overwhelming to them um and most patients you know when they realize it's from a major patient they're kind of just head in hands you know they have no no weapons to deal with it you can be supported and that helps you're gone so i was just going to say fibromyalgia is one of those ones i seem to come across for some reason there's a couple of yeah. indications that i seem to come across a lot and yeah. they're where people just swear by medicinal cannabis and it's all yeah. obviously all anecdotal but fibromyalgia is <laughs> one I find obviously muscle spasticity, but um, yep. Parkinson's is another one that we see. Yep. So we see a huge, but, and also the pain, I guess, that comes from a lot of those neurological disorders. So, see with fibro, um, it seems to me that, you know, I think the mechanism really is that they have a um, hyperactive pain nerves and confused pain nerve centers. And I think that they always feel like they've got the flu. So they always feel headachy and aches and pains and just, worn out and horrible like as if you had the flu Mm. and they always have pretty much always have poor sleep and feel awful when they wake up in the morning um um, and they all often have all the other things that come along with pain problems as well like migraine ibs period pains um tension headaches so they often have like this package of sleep widespread pain, you know, nerve pain, inflammatory pain, um, the annoying pains, like um, not trying to, you know, do it down or anything, but the annoying pains like period pains and, and, and IBS pains um, in, and, and very bad sleep. And with, with THC, you know, you almost invariably can fix their sleep and their day gets better just because they're rested. And what I, what, I, what I think, talking to a lot of fibromyalgic patients, is that their life is just a torture. Mm. Yeah. And they wake up in the morning and they feel awful because they're very tired and the pain starts straight away and it never lets up. And then they can't sleep and it never lets up. And de- no wonder they suffer depression, right? Because every day is, um, is, is just a, a trial, right? Mm. So most doctors are saying, you know, these are kind of hearts what we call heart sick patients it's just head in the hands nothing i can do nothing ever seems to work we tried everything but i don't feel like that because um i've got this one weapon that kind of works against it mm. and um we can for one thing if you fix someone's sleep they f- they just feel like they can cope with stress the next day mm. um 
And, you know, there's a reason why, you know, Guantanamo Bay and so on, sleep, sleep deprivation is used, you know, to break someone because it just yeah. will break you. So if we can fix that for someone, they cope with the stress the next day and they know that, okay, the, you know, the torture ends at night. Yeah, I take my massive, my nice big slug of, you know, THC rich oil, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but also I do find that, you know, CBD and THC both seem to help with all those other daytime symptoms of fibromyalgia as well. So. Well, as you were listing them, I would, they, they all they all have their own, um, they're all listed on the SAS as indications. So when you're talking about IBS, when you're talking about period pain, when you're talking about migraines, yeah. uh, basically every sleep, obviously, and then just chronic right. pain, it's, it's out, you know, that is, they're all candidates for medicinal cannabis. Right. And we've got this one medicine that can do it all. Usually, like I was saying, the, the chronic pain patient, especially the fibromyalgia patient, they'll come in on a migraine preventer, you know, a pain medicine, maybe a, a opiate patch or slow release opiate, um, some IBS medicine, like a, which might be an antidepressant or a um, anti-spasmodic, you know, um, a, you can see there's a long uh, a sleeping pill. Oh, wow. You can see there's yeah. this long list. Yeah. And what I like is that kind of with cannabis, we can we can treat all those symptoms with one agent. It's mm. safe. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, I, I've got a, just a question, which is a little bit, I don't know, zoomed out uh, from pain, but I'm I'm thinking about just generally a point you raised before about how people, if there's an over the counter, are going to be educating themselves uh, to some extent. Um, and the benefits of having a cannabis doctor involved in the treatment. I mean, I, I'm just curious your thoughts on, you, you, at the outset, you talked about how representatives from Little Green Pharma, and, and I know this is common across all of the cannabis companies, were coming to doctors to sort of tell them about cannabis medicine. Um, and Mitch referenced before that um, the ANZ uh, anesthetist, um, you know, that, that professional body has talked about the use being, you know, should only be in a research and clinical trial context. How hard is it for doctors to basically become educated on this topic? If you've got um, professional bodies that are saying, don't use this medicine and and the fact that the laws enabling access were driven by the people. um, I'm just interested because it's unconventional, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So you're asking, how hard is it for doctors to get involved? Yeah, and to become educated because, yeah, yeah it, how do they do it other than through reps? Is, is, it, is there a growing number of you guys that are actually talking and to other doctors <laughs> bringing them into the fold? Yeah, I guess so. Um, well, what was the first part of your question again? Sorry, I, was just, I was just thinking of how- Oh, wait, I've just thought of something that I was going to say that your first part <laughs> of your question um, just made me think of. That's one professional body coming out, you know, um, against the use of cannabis. Right? Yeah. The unfortunate thing is that, you know, of course, there's many professional bodies, yeah. but none of them will really stand up for cannabis. Right? Yeah. And this ties in with what you're saying about doctor education as well. There's already a PBS approved cannabis medication on the market in Australia that any doctor can, can prescribe, yeah. you know, um, which is Sativex. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a you know um, equal balance of THC and CBD in a in a sublingual spray, which is alcohol based. So a lot of people don't like it because it stings a bit. Um, more people don't like it because it's um, really really offensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's already there. It's only <clears throat> its only indication is muscle spasticity and multiple sclerosis. But there's category A. You know there's top level evidence supporting its use in that one single small indication. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the neurologists and then often, you know, neurologists, especially younger neurologists, are all for cannabis treatment. Uh, they just don't really stand up and say it. Yeah. You know, they might mention it kind of in passing in the letters that they send back to us GPs, but they don't really stand up and say it. And there still is a bit of a stigma amongst the medical community to some degree, I'd say. Yeah. It feels yeah. like. Yeah, there is, there is, there is. And it's, but it's changing and partly it's changing with GPs partly because everybody's patients are asking them all the time about it. Yeah. Right? Mm. So like with me, a lot of doctors are just wanting to learn, GPs especially are just wanting to learn more. So there's some really, like there's some really good resources out now, paid resources and um, for doctors to actually get um, qualifications, you know, in cannabis treatment. You'd probably go, the, the questions uh, you get. I won't name drop them, but um, yeah, go on, sorry. 
I was going to say the, the questions you probably get at the clinic are like, number one, where can I get Pfizer instead of AstraZeneca? And number two, yeah. uh, can I get some cannabis? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, one of the most common questions I get about cannabis is, uh, that's not legal, is it? Yeah. yeah if yeah. I mention it as if I suggest it to someone, they generally will say, that's not legal. Yeah. Well, they'll say, oh, it's got that, you know, hallucinogenic stuff taken out though, right? You know, yeah. it has to, you know? And so, so a lot of, pa pa unfortunately, patients just really just don't know anything about cannabis just yet. Yeah. Yeah. And as a doctor, you're not actually, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you actually not allowed to suggest it as a therapy? You have to ask, is that correct or is that not correct? Well, I, I hope that that's not true because um, I think we're allowed to suggest anything that you know, we think okay. is best for the patients. Yeah. I think as long as we fulfill the um, TGA criteria, you know, yeah. um, that it's a medicate reasonably, you know, <clears throat> conventional medications of uh, options have reasonably been exhausted. Yeah. You know, the patient fits the criteria, et cetera, et cetera. Then I think it's okay to suggest it. Um, yep. What we sh what we're not allowed to do is publicly advertise, uh, publicly advocate for it. Mm. um and publicly say oh, this medication you know is wonderful and it has no side effects we're, we're, we'll have to have a ba balanced argument because there is of course there are side effects and there are dangers um, i guess we better talk about some of the adverse effects of cannabis then just in this uh <laughs> just yeah there's been more disclaimers <laughs> coming up right so. um from from your perspective do, do you actually see adverse effects yeah. uh, you've already spoken that it doesn't work for everybody and people yeah. you know, do report that they don't necessarily it doesn't solve every issue you might have, then unlike some people who <laughs> seem to tout cannabis will solve all your problems and your relationship yeah. problems and it will bake yeah. you a cake. But um, do you find that there are actual adverse reactions? Do you come across them? Yes. Um, um, one reason for that is because everybody's um, natural kind of tolerance is, is extremely variable. Yeah. And some people can just chug a whole bottle of cannabis oil and notice and they get nothing. Um, and some people um, can have a literally just a sniff of CBD and they're, you know, they, they feel sedated for days. Yeah. And I've seen both, you know, both ends of the spectrum. I've seen both. Um, <clears throat> and so it's super unpredictable. You can, I, I can't look at someone and guess how they're going to react. So you always have to start super low and go, go slowly. Yeah. Um, and the side effects come from, um, not doing that really, right? So I remember you talking to Matt more about um, tolerance, you know, tolerance to medicine and to the cannabis medicine, the dose may need to go up and then at a certain point you might want to take a tolerance break, you know, you reset your tolerance so that you actually um, um, are more sensitive to the beneficial effects again. But actually there's two sides to the tolerance um, coin with cannabis. Patients need tolerance. Because the first thing you experience um, with with um, with exposure to cannabis is is a side effect or is unpleasant. You know, at the low dose, you will notice side effects like um, feeling a bit spacey or dizzy or maybe even feeling a bit high or feeling a bit out of it. If you persist with that tiny dose, that settles really quickly, and you need to give time to develop tolerance to to the side effects. So tolerance is a big part of um, Tolerance is needed, you know, it's not just a dirty word. Like um, and often, you know, if patients say, look, it doesn't work for me, it's because they've not taken, you know, that six weeks that might be needed to go up super slowly, all the way up to that big high dose that they need, because they have high tolerance to the beneficial effects and low tolerance to the side effects. So you need to build, to you need to build tolerance into the treatment. And you need to not be afraid of it when it comes because we can reset it very, you know, tolerance to the beneficial side effects, we can reset it very easily with a quick break. Yeah. And just, I, I, um, it makes sense when you put it like that. Uh, I've now been on a, a tolerance break for about 10 years, but I remember, <laughs> I remember previously at uh, a while ago, there was, there was a, a period where that, to you're right, the tolerance does build up quickly and, and it's actually it's actually enjoyable to have a certain level of tolerance. Otherwise it can be quite overwhelming as a, as a, a new recruit, if you like. Um, I do personally remember that experience. I, I think you've sort of replaced that tolerance um, with alcohol perhaps in more recent years. <laughs> yeah. I've got a bit of, a bit of a tolerance to that as well now. 
you, thank you for teaching me, Andrew. Actually that's, that's got a very poor um, side effect profile yeah. and very poor uh, safety profile, actually. Uh, which very is. poor. Very well, it, it didn't stop the um, that guy from Ansker actually referenced that uh, for a lot of pain management, he thought that a trip to Dan Murphy's and picking up yeah. would be um, would be perhaps more beneficial. Which, yeah, interesting view. Um, and as you said, there's lots of professional bodies with lots of different views. So thankfully, there are a plural plurality of views out there. I think that you know that isn't necessarily wrong. You know. Um, what he said it's been taken out of context i'm not trying to defend that that statement but it's obviously been taken out of context it's just trying to flip, flippantly show that yeah you give someone enough brandy you know and you can amputate their leg you know and there was years of you know <clears throat> sailors and pirates you know demonstrating that right um but it's not a it's obviously it's obviously not a good therapeutic option because of the um the therapeutic window is quite um difficult to judge right <laughs> yeah. so one bottle of brandy yourself. you can amputate their leg two bottles of brandy they they're long dead you know yeah so, um, yeah and half of you know if, if three quarters of a bottle of brandy they feel every sort of every sort of um every cut you know so yeah yeah it's very hard to get right yeah from experience yes you do feel every yes. <laughs> <laughs> excellent all right well i think um I think that's kind of you talked for a while. Yeah, yeah I, I, good. 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 I, I feel like we can talk for hours, and and I'm going to just say straight off the bat that we fully intend to, Steve, because I think yeah. we'll be back if uh, if you're agreeable to that. Um, I, can, I can waffle for hours on this topic. Yeah. We can do that question. So yeah. I thank you for um for joining us. Thanks very much for having. Me. For having me. We'll definitely get you back uh, back on in the future, and we would love to hear a little bit more about. Any anything else with the Canaponics project that you're doing? I uh, would love to know how that's going. And um, yeah, talk I can update you. And let you Absolutely. Know how it's yeah, it's quite a quite a um, quite a compelling project actually. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah, I want to I wanted to unpack and yeah, we'll do it on the next one. But just that whole idea of transforming a town from a coal town to a you know clean green town is um, is amazing. I know there's a lot of renewables that are being plugged into this project so we'll we'll, un we'll unpack that oh, yeah. on, and uh, um we from time to time we get a um this is really quite cool um we get a a, a, f a film crew sort of follow us around and add little bits to their potential um um documentary they're trying to pitch to netflix which is pretty uh, uh, very cool very pretty cool yeah i never thought i'd find myself doing something like that <laughs> and do they get you to they're like like no no steve just pretend to look out the window and, and all that <laughs> That already was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, very good. And um, look, actually, something I forgot to say at the start, and if anyone is still listening, we thank you for <laughs> continued support. I hope you are. You should you should still be listening because everything Steve said is highly relevant and interesting. But um, please hit subscribe wherever you are listening to these crazy alt med episodes. We're on YouTube. We're on our on the website. Um, we're on Facebook. Are we on Twitter and LinkedIn yet? Is that happening? Now we're, we're actually on all the podcasts now, like Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all the rest. So it's starting to move a bit. Hey, we're gonna, we're gonna be huge. End of this year, we'll be ranked number one for sure. Yeah, we thought Steve's coming on. We better get serious. So we've, we've extended the... After we release this episode, Steve, we're just going to go to the moon. I promise. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All uh, time hit like, like, please like, please yeah. like. <laughs> so thank you for everyone for listening and a big special thank you to steve for joining us we'll do this again soon but uh until then take care thank you see you yes. thanks steve bye